Let us pray. Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the last two weeks, our family has been engrossed in a Netflix show testing the limits of people's gifts. This show brings together teams of two people from different parts of the country who do not previously know each other. The contest challenges them in the impossible, baking impossible. It's the American cooking competition series themed around baking and engineering. Its creator, Andrew Smith, was a contestant on The Great British Bake Off. Each episode presents a cast of contestants with a challenge that combines baking and engineering. And you guessed it, it's now baconeering. And contestants are named baconeers. One talented baker brings their best gifts. One engineer brings skills in physics, mechanics, or design to the table of edible masterpieces. Each test is a design of culinary and engineering deliciousness. All edible creations defy the limits of force, acceleration, gravity. Edible boats must float. 10 foot tall gingerbread structures must withstand the earthquake simulator. Bridges made with ramen noodles and modeling chocolate withstand 150 pounds of pressure. And eight foot long cake cars with a test dummy at the steering wheel face a head on collision with a cement wall going 25 miles an hour. The car going 25 miles an hour into the cement wall. It's my favorite episode, Crash Test Yummy. What strikes me about this show is how bakers and engineers bring their gifts to, draw, to the drawing board and design and implement impossible creations. As you can imagine, delicious treats or calculations didn't always work out. Lots of cake and confections were sacrificed to the small g gods of physics in epic proportion. To my recollection, no one ever made a fruit cake. Fruit cake. It's a tricky gift to give. Fruit cake. Whether giving or receiving, it can always get mixed reviews. It reminds me that gifts are a tricky business. Giving them, receiving them, it's just so easy for things to go wrong. Gifts are a big topic in Corinth a topic that Paul addresses in his letter to the community that Sarah read a few moments ago. A little background. Corinth is a bustling, diverse city. The church reflects that diversity. In a time and place when people stick with their own ethnic group, their own, religious, their own religion and gender, their same social and economic status, along comes Paul and the early early followers of Jesus who throw everyone in together, men and women, young and old, Jewish and pagan, peasant and aristocrat. It's a bold experiment bringing all of those different kinds of people together into the church and expect that they get along. Well, they don't. And one of the things they disagree about is gifts. Paul isn't talking about edible arrangements and confections. He's talking about churchy gifts. Paul lists the kind of gifts that are present early in this chapter and that are present in the people in the church in Corinth. Things like wisdom, healing, discernment. What matters to Paul is how we perceive those gifts and how those wor gifts work together. Evidently, there are folks in the church in Corinth who think their gifts are better than other people's gifts. Some of us don't need other people to tell us that our gifts don't matter. We do enough of that on our own. 
It was a Sunday evening at youth group, and during our Bible study, we looked at the entirety of chapter 12 in 1 Corinthians. And then I traced out a human body on butcher paper and set out some crayons. And I asked the youth to draw their gifts on their paper. The body of Christ, I explained, Paul's image for talking about the church. One young man stood back for a while and to the side, and I asked him if he would put his gift on the paper. And he said, I would if I could, but the truth is I don't have any gifts. Well, I tried to encourage him, thinking of gifts that I had seen in him, but after I asked him to identify the gifts, I realized he honestly didn't believe that he had any gifts to offer the world. When did you first hear that message? That you don't have anything to offer? Or that you weren't fit enough, or smart enough, or strong enough? When did you first hear that? From your parents? From your boss? Maybe from a friend? Or was it the church? Well, that's happening in Corinth. That's what Paul is responding to in this letter. That's why he is so insistent and so clear and so unambiguous with his words. According to Paul, from God's perspective, everyone has gifts and all of the gifts have value. Equal value because they all come from God. Which means that the things that we are good at, they just don't belong to us as individuals. They belong to all of us because they belong to God. Here's the kicker. The gifts that are present in the community at any given time are enough. We have everything that we need. And that's hard to believe at some time, sometimes. We, this church community, at any given point, have what we need. Resources, human capital, vision, to be a light of hope and justice in this community. It means that this city has enough. We have enough leadership, we have enough resources, we have enough human capital, for example, to dramatically improve affordable housing in this city for our city's most vulnerable. Or we have enough of all of those things to curb violence against our black and brown brothers and sisters. That means in this world, we have enough scientific knowledge and the resources and the imagination to, for example, reverse the effects of climate change. As we know all too well, having the gifts in the room isn't enough. What is so often missing is the appreciation of what our own gifts are, an awareness and an appreciation of the gifts of others and some interest in pooling them all together for the common good, especially now. Historically, we, we know people pull together when they face some external threat, fire, flood, hurricane. These things have traditionally brought diverse communities together for a common response. That hasn't happened so well during the pandemic. And I can tell you why. It's the fault of other people. You know, you know who I'm talking about. If everyone just saw the world the way I see the world, we could be all united together on the same common strategy and with same common purpose. Here's sarcasm. I can see Paul shaking his head at me. Maybe that's not a helpful place to start. But maybe if we start here. If one member suffers, all suffer together with it. If one member is honored, all rejoice together with it. We are all in this together. So I brought this text to a couple of different groups of church leaders this past week. And I asked them to think about the ways in which their skills are celebrated in their families, in the church, in the community, in the world. Boy, they had good ideas. They could quickly identify their own gifts. And I asked them then to think about 
those that they know and care about and trust, to identify some of their skills and their gifts. And they were quick to identify those. Well, then I asked them to think about the person or persons who frustrate them the most. And I asked them to get a good picture of who that person or persons were. And I asked them to think about those particular gifts that that person or persons offer. Well, as you can imagine, there was much more silence on that part. They had to think a little harder on that one. This part was much more tedious. Brow furrowing, gut wrenching to be able to name a gift of somebody who frustrates you. Well, Paul is speaking of a ministry in a world where it takes a village or a body of varying members and ministries. Paul's gift to the church in Corinth is a message to continue the work that Jesus began in the gospel lesson that was just read. Uh, Jesus' beginning of his ministry, where he reads the repeating Isaiah vision of hope and transforming work in the world. That is Jesus' call to release the captives, to let those go free. When we see everyone in our family or church or city or nation as having gifts to share, things go much better. And when we stop doing that, when we stop assuming that everyone has something to contribute, things go awry. And Paul knows this. Paul knows that it's not enough to have all the gifts in the room. The hard part is for everyone else to see that as well, to value your own gifts, to respect the gifts of others, to not rank them one, two, and three, and not value one gift over another, but to work together for the common good. That's why he mentions the Spirit so often. He wants us to remember that these gifts all come from God, that everyone is a recipient of a gift from God. And when we remember that, when we remember that, we recognize and value the gifts of others. We discover that we have an abundance of gifts at our disposal. So I want to return to the Baconeers. They had so many gifts in that room. The teams of two, their skills were amazing. Their designs and creations, outstanding. And those who struggled to work together, to listen to one another, to value the other person's gifts, inevitably left the show pretty early. Those who could identify their own gifts, their own gifts, claim them, and recognize and collaborate with with their partner's gifts to find some synergy toward a a common goal, ultimately completed the final mission. Paul concludes in this part of his attempt to address the spiritual hierarchy is that there aren't things that set people apart, right? Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healers, speakers of tongues. One is not more important than the other. All are needed and all need the others to be who they are and to do what they do. Each must speak together for the greater gifts of the Spirit, in one Spirit. Gifts that thus far have been coincided with a particular task as they have been given. A still more excellent way, Paul says, he will show us, and Christ will show us, that the still more excellent way is living God's intention in grace and love and peace. All of these gifts are useless without the greatest gift that the church has been given in Jesus Christ. And that is the gift of love. May it be so. Amen.